only five years after the debut of Advanced Dungeons and Dragons in 1977, and after only five volumes of hardback books in the series had been published, Gary Gygax was already talking about an expansion to the game that eventually would lead to the creation of the second edition of Advanced Dungeons and Dragons in 1989. Initially, Gary was focused on talking about new classes that he was exploring for this expansion, and we're going to talk about those, the Jester, the Mountebank, the Mystic, and the Savant, today on Daddy Roll to One. Please help support more Daddy Roll to One by buying a t-shirt, hoodie, mug, poster, notebook, or other items from my shop. Thank you. Hello there, and welcome back. I'm Martin, and this is another video in my series on the history of early tabletop role-playing games, including Dungeons and Dragons, and one of the companies that published them, Tactical Studies Rules, and one of its later descendant companies, TSR Hobbies. Today I'm going to be talking about a series of changes that Gary Gygax was proposing that would take us from first edition Advanced Dungeons and Dragons into what eventually would become a new version of the game, second edition Advanced Dungeons and Dragons. So when I was making my notes for this video, I discovered that there was a lot of material and so this is actually going to be the first of, I think, two videos. It might stretch to three when I start making them. But as of right now, I'm considering it's going to be two. And this first video that we're talking about today, I'm going to talk about a series of changes that Gary was proposing back in 1982, where he was focusing mostly on new classes that might be added to an expansion of the game. So today we'll be talking about those classes. And then the next video, I'm going to be talking about a few years later in time, about three years later, after the publication of Unearthed Arcana and Oriental Adventures, when Gary starts talking about combining all of those materials and all of the books that have been published up to that date and revising the organization and layout. And he starts talking about what he would remove from a proposed edition or revision and what he would add and what he would change. So that's going to be the focus of that video. And then it's going to discuss what we actually got, because of course, Gary is going to end up no longer being at TSR for about three years before second edition Advanced Dungeons and Dragons is published. And so what we get is not what Gary had originally thought, but I do want to talk about some of the changes that were made that actually Gary had presaged when he was writing these articles in Dragon Magazine. So uh, again, I'm doing this in two long videos, or, or, <laughs> but are shorter than they would have been had I combined them together. And um, I do want to say thank you to everybody who, uh, in my last video on the Marvel superheroes role playing game, when I talked about the idea that my videos are very, very long, it goes against conventional YouTube wisdom that you know you max want like ten minutes because people have no attention span anymore. And I got so many people in the comments that said they actually prefer and enjoy my long form videos. I know a lot of you listen to them without watching. Um, which is great. And I'm trying to keep that in mind as I'm making these videos that some of you are doing that. And that might eventually lead to maybe putting them in another format, a, I don't know, a podcast or something. If that's something that you think is interesting, let me know. But uh, I really, really appreciated all of the comments of the people that were very supportive and said, no, they they actually prefer and enjoy the longer form comment. Uh, we have such a great community here that we've built. And uh, I always enjoy when I jump into the comments, there's actually a tab that allows you as the creator to see the comments that have been held for review. So YouTube will automatically flag some comments and hold them aside and not publish them if it thinks that they're offensive or contains content that shouldn't be shared. And I can count, I think, on one hand the number of times in over a year that I've had a comment pop up there that that fit that category. So it, usually I go to that tab and it's just completely blank. And I really appreciate you all for your um just being kind in the comments. So speaking of the community, uh, I will be at DaveCon 2024 at the end of April, the 26th to the 28th. And uh, I have recently learned, uh, I know it's for Dave Arneson, but I was reminded that it is also a celebration of two other Daves that are important in the history of tabletop role-playing game. Dave Wesley, who created Bronstein or Brownstein, Bronstein, 
sorry. Uh, but it, that was the precursor game to Dave Arneson's Blackmore. And then Dave Magari, who created the game Dungeon, the board game version that was an early look at how to translate a Dungeons and Dragons type game into a, a board game format. So all three Daves were part of the same gaming group in the Twin Cities area. And this convention is honoring all three of them. So I will be there. I will be wearing merchandise from my shop, mainly just so that people have a way to easily identify me. So if you, because I don't show myself on camera, obviously. So um, if you see, you know, one of these, someone wearing one of these shirts or, or this hoodie, uh, come up and say, hi, I'd love to meet um, fans of the channel and, uh, and thank you for your support. Okay, so let's get in and talk about what was going on in 1982 when Gary starts thinking about this. So as you know from my previous videos, first edition Advanced Dungeons & Dragons was published over the course of three years in three different books. So Monster Manual 1977, Player's Handbook 1978, and then the Dungeon Master's Guide 1979. Okay, so this is a later printing with a different cover, but it is still a first edition, not a second edition Dungeons & Dragons book, Advanced Dungeons & Dragons. Okay, so the rules... Were, were spread across three years, unlike now, or like in subsequent editions where all three core books were published simultaneously and released on the same day. They didn't do that for Advanced Dungeons Dragons because Gary was writing the rules as he went along. Okay. So then you have in 1980, the release of Deities and Demigods. Okay. And I just talked about this a lot in my video on the tribute to James Ward, the author of this book, who unfortunately passed away just last month. Um, which you can see more details on that book in that video. And then Finfolio, a collection of creatures mostly taken from um, the White Dwarf magazine in the UK. Now, there were some things in here, some creatures that had been uh, previously published in different modules, like the Drow are in here, and they first appeared in the Giant series of modules. But um, a monster book. So this is published in 1981. But now in 1982, there is no new book or advanced Dungeons and Dragons being published. No new rule book, like hardback book, okay? So Gary is then, um, I think, trying to keep interest alive and let people know that, like, no, the game isn't going to stop. It's just, you know, he's, he's, he's busy. He's writing. So this period of time, with the exception of... Um, Deities and Demigods, which, you know, again, it was written by James Ward and, and was mostly based on work that he had done previously in Gods, Demigods and Heroes. And then the Fiend Folio, which was a collection of things. Um, Gary is pretty much the one who's like primarily driving all of the rules of advanced Dungeons and Dragons. Very specifically, you will recall that there are two simultaneously published games happening at the time at TSR. There's advanced Dungeons and Dragons. And then there's just Dungeons and Dragons, two completely separate lines overseen by different people, different rules, different adventures, like everything. Right. So Gary's focusing on advanced. So he starts writing in 1982 in Dragon Magazine, and he mentions that he is working on a volume two of the Monster Manual. So that's something that he's working on. And then in issue number 63, in 1982 of Dragon Magazine, he debuts a new subclass of fighter called the Barbarian. And in that article, he mentions that he's working on a bunch of different classes, but the Barbarian was the one that most folks that were testing it seemed to think was like pretty much ready to go. And so he presented the class in that magazine and saying like, this is a new, you know, subclass for the game. And uh, but, you know, he does mention he has other classes that he's working on, but it, like the Barbarian was the one that was closest to being in a finished final form. Okay, so that's issue number 63. Now, we talked about the Barbarian earlier. I have a whole video on the history of the Barbarian class. This is the article I want to spend most of our time with today in this particular video. This is from Dragon number 65. Okay, and um, in this article here. Gary has a column at this point in the magazine, and it usually runs every month. Not always, but it's pretty close. And it was called From the Sorcerer's Scroll. And basically anything that you saw in here was, you know, quote unquote official. Okay. So like anything, like all of the classes that Gary debuts in here are official. They're considered official classes. Um, he has an article where he writes about monsters, um, and it was in the same article where the Barbarian class, the same issue where the Barbarian class debuted, number 63. He debuts like the Divas 
of monsters that eventually will be in Monster Manual 2. And he mentions how the majority of the monsters that you see in the creature feature in Dragon Magazine are unofficial, meaning they're not approved for use with Advanced Dungeons Dragons or Dungeons Dragons officially. Um, you can use them, but you know, you might want official creatures. And so the ones Gary writes are official. He makes that very clear, where the ones that anybody else writes are not official. But in any case, he writes this article, and it's called Character Classes to Consider. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of read through this. I'm going to speed through part of it, but I want to give you the sense of what is being talked about in this article. And so I'm going to hold it up to the camera here and read it. Now, as I'm editing it, I might decide that it makes more sense to just put screenshots up so that it's not moving around as much. But let me know in the comments which would you prefer um, I know some people don't like when my hands shake and I'm holding it. I try to hold it as still as possible. But in any sense, let's let's get into this article and see what we're talking about here. So he says the barbarian, the barbarian class in issue number 63 was, as mentioned, only one of several classes being considered for inclusion in the expansion volume for the advanced D&D game. So here he's calling it an expansion. And he says, you loyal, loyal readers have a chance to input into this projected work, and I would be very pleased if you could do so. The classes under consideration are listed below. So he says, let me know which ones you like best, which ones you like least. And he says, you know, maybe the editor will allow me to publish them in the magazine. So then he jumps in to talk about them. So the first off, we have the cleric and a subclass called the mystic. This subclass of clerics is concerned more with the prediction and detection than are other sorts of clerics. All mystics are of good alignment, although they can be chaotic, neutral, or lawful. And as with other sorts of clerics, mystics would have seven levels of spells. Now, in this version of the game, in advanced D&D, clerics and druids only had uh, seven levels of spells, whereas magic users and illusionists had nine. That's just how they did the game back then. And he says, but most would be of the sort to divine or detect. However, some new spells and some very powerful upper level spells are planned. And then he goes into the fighter and he talks about the cavalier. And this is a subclass of fighter that must be of knightly or noble origin. So the class type would be usable only in those campaigns, which had social systems of the sort appropriate to this. Allows for any alignment, uh, which is interesting. He's going to end up changing that later. And he says it differs from other types of fighters, mainly in that its members would have more basic weapons, horsemanship, and possible organizational abilities to allow for more henchmen and followers. And he says that at its upper levels, it would also gain additional strength and constitution points due to training exposure to hardship. Okay. okay. Uh, then he goes into this class of magic user subclass called the savant. And he says it specializes in knowledge, understanding, and arcane subjects. Thus, as do mystics, savants possess a fair range of detection spells. Although they know many standard stores of spells as well, savants have many new magics in the nine levels of spells possible for them to employ. Savants can use spells common only to clerics and druids. And at higher level, savants can read and employ scrolls of sorts of all sorts because of the scholarly aspects of this proposed class elven and half elven savants are envisioned as being able to progress several levels higher than if they were normal magic users that is 14th or even 16th for elves and 10th or 12th for half elves savants can be of any alignment then he talks about this subclass of thief called the mountebank which is a thief that specializes in deception sleight of hand persuasion and a bit of illusion these factors together with speed are what the mountebank relies upon. However, disguise and theatrics also provide valuable tools of the trade to this class so that one might never know if one has been had by this class. Then he has a specialization of the thief called the acrobat. A normal thief, after attaining media level, can opt to continue as normal or become an acrobat. Although no further skills of type which considers manual dexterity would be gained, the thief acrobat would gain skills in leaping, vaulting, tumbling, tightrope walking, etc. Such a thief type would be a cat burglar sort. The earlier special Specialization takes place the greater the acro acrobatic skills, as this specialization would have an upper level, le upper limit of skill. And then he talks about a jester class. Now we have talked about jesters before in um, my video on some of the lost lost classes of Dragon Magazine. But he says Rob Kuntz is working on one for inclusion in his unpublished module, The Tower of Zayin. And then there was a recent issue of Dragon Magazine, which was number 60, that included a jester as an NPC class. Now that's the one that I talked about specifically, that one from issue number 60. And then he says, because I have also considered the gesture as an actual class, I have not yet read either description. So he's claiming that he doesn't want to be influenced by what other people have said. Um, 
And he says, as I envision them, they could be human, no more halfling, and then elves could never permit themselves to do it. And elf dwarves are just too serious. He doesn't address half orcs at all, um, but he doesn't say that they could. So I guess the implication is be that they wouldn't. Um, alignment is whatever you want. A gesture would have a combination of verbal, magical, and acrobatic skills, which allow the class to be viable, even though there would be no great power. Verbal skills would enable the character in to influence many creatures towards kindliness, humor, forgetfulness, thoughtful consideration, irritation, anger, or even rage. Magical skills would have to do with jokes and tricks, sort of a directed wand of wonder with some magic user spells and illusions illusionist magic tossed in acrobatic skills would be mainly tumbling and juggling with some magic tossed in there and as well and then he has level titles already wag punster masker harlequin clown juggler buffoon fool joker jester powerful at its upper levels the class would be less popular with fellow adventures i suspect so that jesters will frequently have enemies and travel alone Okay, and then he goes into the Grand Druid here. So I'm not going to talk about that because that's basically just expanding the level limits of the Druid class, which up until this point, I think it stopped at level 14, if I remember correctly. So those are the classes that he's talking about here. So what I'm going to do in this video is talk about what happens to each of these classes, okay? And and where, where can we get insight into what these classes would have actually been like? So three of them are going to be very, very easy. Well, the Barbarian, we already know, um, because it already had been published at this point, okay? So that's this article. Let's then jump to two issues later. This is Dragon Magazine number uh, 67. OK, and in this magazine, Gary is going to expand on this article and answer some fan mail that he got or you know, not fan mail, but like letters written in of talking about which classes were of the most interest. OK, so Gary actually writes a lot of, of stuff in this particular issue. This is issue number 67. Again, this is from November of 1982. And. I thought it was page six, uh, 51, but I think it's page 61. There it is. Loyal readers, EGG, so E. Gary Gygax, answers questions or answers letters on new classes and takes a long look at comeliness. We're not going to get into the comeliness article right now. Okay, so here he says, uh, lest I be forced to an existence of doing nothing save answering your flood of missives, please forgive, please be forgiving if I am unable to answer each of you personally though I shall indeed attempt to do so. At times all writers feel as if they are addressing a void, for seldom does an article bring any response. An occasional letter of praise, or of critical, even insulting nature, is often a treasure, for such tokens indicate that someone is actually reading what is written at great effort. Allow me now to add a new identity to readers of this column. Hyperactive enthusiasts. I am inundated with responses, and I am pleased, for I do indeed need the benefits of of your thinking. <laughs> I just think that's hilarious because um, th th this is just so typical of Gary Gygax's writing and reading that now, I sometimes wonder if that's how folks feel like my intros are too long, <laughs> but in any event, um, so he basically says that he was at the World Science Fiction Convention in early September, and he began to understand that like there was interest in people wanting an expansion to the advanced Dungeons and Dragons game system. So you know, Gary, had, that's why Gary's talking about like I'm working on a second volume of Monsters, and I'm working on these new classes. He's letting people know he's heard them, he understands people want it to be expanded, and so he's working on that. Okay, and then he says uh, the audience was um, you know basically interested in the new character classes that were posed then, which. I think makes sense. Those are some of the easiest and kind of more, more fun things to talk about, right? Is, is new character classes. And so uh, he basically says that, you know, th th that's what he's going to be talking about here. And he says, um, I'm not overly sensitive to your opinions and blah, blah, blah. So he, he says that, like, I, I want you to tell me what you think. So that helps me to know what to include in the game. And then he says, the range of comments was astounding. There was absolutely no consensus of opinion as to which class is most desirable for every letter, which listed the savant on the top, which I find hard to believe, but okay. Um, and the gesture on the bottom, I seem to find another one which reversed the ratings. I have gone ahead with the thief acrobat split. And he says, editor note, the description will appear in issue number 69. So it does. Um, and I do have that issue. And he says, and I sincerely hope all of you will favor me with your immediate impressions and considered opinions garnered from actual play. Input from you is helping me 
finalizing the Barbarian subclass of fighters, just as actual playtesting here is. Cavaliers were usually rated in the upper middle range, and that average was carried through for mountebanks as well. Mystic rated the lowest since no individual's rating had it at number one. However, in the, from the general comments, I fear that is as much due to my own inadequate description of the class. And then he says, several good readers suggested that I seek ideas from character classes published elsewhere. And he says, I can't do that. Copyrights, copyright issues are what they are. And he says, I make it a point not to read other systems and articles for I don't wish to plagiarize. <laughs> so, okay. I mean, to me, I think that's short-sighted. I think being aware of what other people is doing, it would be important toward game design, but he's specifically saying he doesn't do that. Um, we know from previous things that I've, published here before like on the thief class for example the thief class was not a gary gygax creation that was created by folks out on my side of, of the country um from the arrow hobbies group out in santa monica where they phone called him you know they he they someone phoned gary and said hey we have this class and gary took notes and eventually published it in greyhawk he did thank the guy in greyhawk but that class later basically comes into advanced D D um as is and there's never another thank you mentioned uh, okay, but anyway, he says that he's, he doesn't want to play dry. Then he talks about what will not be covered in the expansion are the anti-paladin. Gary hated anti-paladins. Um, we talked about the anti-paladin class before in one of my earlier videos that was proposed in Dragon Magazine. He says that's not going to be in there. And he says also the samurai is not going to be in there. So he says an assassin is as close as you should get to, to an anti-paladin. Um, you don't need, and he says there's evil, strong, and, and you know, uh, well represented in the game. You don't need another champion for it. And um, he just doesn't see the point of having an anti-paladin class. And then um, he says samurai are a different story. And he says, you know, the monk isn't really part of a medieval tradition either. Um, but he says, you know, it so it belongs in a, what he says is an oriental based game. He says, but then why not include the samurai? And he's basically saying, why compound the error? Like he's already kind of he's sort of backtracking on why he included the monk. Okay. And then he says, I intend to move the monk to the appendices where the bard uh, now resides. Sorry. And, um, and then he says, it is hoped that sometime soon we can be begin on another version of the AD and D game, which is based on basically Asian culture. And while such a work will, will be aimed pri principally for sale in the far East, you may rest assured that an English language version will be available to all interested players so that a complete meaningful campaign based on the oriental tradition and myth can be run. Well, that means ninja, samurai, ronin, yakuza, monks, and possibly Taoist clerics. And uh, then he talks about there will be a setting for that with, you know, deities and arms and armor and monsters and all that kind of thing. So all the way here in November of 1982, he's already talking about this idea that is eventually going to become this book oriental adventures okay so he's already talking about that in this article and saying that like that's where a samurai class would appear which in fact it does this comes out in 1985 and as i recall i think i mentioned this last time i think it was tsr's bestseller the year that it came out and there was a lot that came out that year okay so this is what he's talking about as far as like what classes were the most popular so the thief acrobat does end up being published in Dragon in issue number 69. And uh, I unfortunately, I do have the issue here, as you see. Um, but uh, the cover is missing. So I got this from a friend. And, you know, the covers were stapled on these magazines. And um, they came off just all the time. Now, every magazine that I ever purchased myself still has the cover. But magazines that I got from friends, a lot of times they are missing the cover. But um, you can see here that from the Sorcerer's Scroll on page 20. So Gary debuts the Thief Acrobat class in this magazine, the Split class, he calls it. And it's in here. This article gets picked up pretty much as is with no changes and makes it into this book, Unearthed Arcana along with the Barbarian class from issue number 63. And then also the Cavalier class from issue number 72. I do have that issue. Whoops. So give me a second here. So the Cavalier comes out in this issue, number 72. See here the Cavalier subclass. And... 
it also makes its way into unearthed arcana basically as is so you can see i just was talking about how the covers are so um fragile so this one is this one is off i still have the cover but it is unfortunately detached you can see some staple rust on there as well unfortunately but um this was the second issue of dragon that i ever got so anyway so let's talk about these classes so again three of the classes that gary talks about in these two articles are going to end up here in unearthed arcana 1985 so it's the cavalier now the cavalier he's gone from making it a subclass and he's made it its own class and so what happens in this book is that rather than being a fighter subclass it's a standard it's you know core class standard class whatever you want to call it. and then he moves the paladin to become a subclass of the cavalier and basically gives the paladin all the abilities of the cavalier plus the extra goodies from being a paladin so that's the cavalier class that ends up and then uh the barbarian class ends up in here as well again pretty much lifted from that article in dragon number 63 and we have talked about um again we've talked about before the uh, barbarian and then you have the thief acrobat split class that appears in here as well and again pretty much picked up exactly from what was in dragon magazine so what's funny is and i forget exactly where it is but there's a, an adjustment table here where it talks about and I, I did mention this before in another one of my videos but like in terms of mistakes so there's a thing here where i think it, it gives you like the jumping is in feet or inches but then at another point it tells you to add a percentage uh to your die when you're calculating your your jump and how far you can go and people are like how come the tables don't match like why is it a percentage instead of just saying you add extra feet and I i'm not telling that story exactly but the point is is that that was a mistake that crept into the article in dragon magazine no editor caught it it got copied and pasted pretty much as is into this book which is why this book has so much errata it was a big deal at the time that so many people uh, were complaining about all the mistakes that made it into this game because this book was rushed. So the reason that this book comes out when it does is because TSR is not doing well. It is, um, uh, it, it went through a, a bad period of time. There's a whole things that you can read about this, but the short version is Gary Gygax is out on the West Coast trying to get a TSR Entertainment Corporation going to make a Dungeons and Dragons movie. What comes out of that is the D&D &D cartoon that we got on CBS, uh, three seasons of that. And that comes from Gary's dealings out on the West Coast. But while he's out there, people are running TSR, um, the Bloom Brothers and other people. And there were a lot of mistakes being made. Gary claims he didn't know anything about it. Whatever the case is, doesn't matter. Gary comes back, reinserts himself into the management of the company and immediately publishes this book as a way to make money to kind of help keep TSR in the black. Okay, so that was one of the reasons this book was so rushed. And essentially all this book is, is a collection of articles that Gary had written in Dragon Magazine over the years. There's, I have a whole video about this book to learn more about that, okay? So those are the three classes that make it into publication. So then we have four classes left that we wanna talk about. And that's gonna be the Savant, the Jester, the Mystic, and the Mountebank. All right, and that's just what I'm gonna spend the rest of this video talking about. And what this video is gonna be about is essentially saying what could have been, what were these classes intended to be? What was Gary thinking of doing with them? And what might they have looked at in a, an expansion of the game? So I'm not going to create my own version of the, of the class. Other people have done that. So I'm not statting them out, I'm giving you all that kind of stuff. I'm just talking about what did Gary say he thought that these classes might be like. Now I will point out that there is a whole book out there um, and I just forgot the name of it. I'll put it in the show notes, but somebody has published a book that's basically his version of what he thought Gary wanted to do with Advanced Dungeons & Dragons 2nd Edition. I've never read that book. I've never played it. I've never looked at it, but it is available for folks that are interested in that kind of thing. Um, but what I did was go and look at what did Gary actually say? What were his comments that he wrote? And these are mostly coming from three sources. They're coming from Gary's uh, when he was still alive, he was active on message boards on um, Ian World, and also I think it was called Dragon's Foot. And so, where he would actually jump in, and and people would ask him questions, and he would answer. And a lot of those questions involved what would he have done with the second edition of Advanced D and D. 
The other thing that we have to look at that we can kind of see where Gary was going with his game design is, well, first off, we have those classes from Dragon Magazine that ended up in Unearthed Arcana. And as you see, especially stuff like the Cavalier and the Barbarian, they're very heavy, very long classes. So if we look at Let's just look at the fighter class from the player's handbook, 1978. Okay. So here's your description of the fighter. That's it. That's, that's, that's all you need to play the fighter. I mean, you've got your, you've got your experience point table down here. Okay. So there you go. But that is your fighter class. Okay. So granted, I'm picking a very specific example, but let's look at the cavalier which goes for, there's a page, it's page two, it's page three, half a column or half a page, and then half a column on the, on the second part. Okay. So that's your, that's your whole description for you, Cavalier. Now let's look at barbarians. Here's page one, page two, page three, page four, Okay, actually, no, sorry, that's Rangers. Yeah, sorry, Ranger kicks in right there, so that's my fault. But still, you've got two and a half pages for the Barbarian, whereas you had um, not even a full column for the Fighter. Now, I understand, again, that Fighter is a different kind of class. It's, you know, it's designed to be like your basic class. But the more Gary spends time designing in advanced D&D, the more he's adding complexity and new rules and new subsystems and all this kind of stuff. And so we can kind of get a sense that these new classes are going to be much more, I don't want to use the word, word robust. I'm just going to say complicated, complex. They're going to have many more rules to them than the rules that we're used to in the classes that first debut in the player's handbook in 1978. So he's, because he's kind of covered those classes. So all these new ones are going to be variations on things he's already done by just adding more and more and more stuff. Okay. So the other place that we can look to get a sense of what he's doing is a game that is published in 1992 by Game Designers Workshop written by Gary Gygax called Dangerous Journeys. Okay, so it was originally going to be called Dangerous Dimensions or DD, but TSR sued and said, no, you can't use that name. So they used the name Dangerous Journeys. And this is a game that Gary wrote essentially to address questions or concerns or criticisms or issues of things that people had with Dungeons and Dragons. And so it includes things like skill systems and uh, changes around the weapon proficiencies to allow it for classes to be a little bit more free in the kinds of weapons that they use rather than the restrictions that you had in Dungeons and Dragons. It changes a lot of stuff like that, but it is essentially a class and level game and it is a fantasy game and it has a setting called Mythos, which is, um, what the kind of the D and D like version of dangerous journeys is, is this mythos book. And so TSR is eventually going to um, sue uh, for this one as well. And it, um, it has eventually stopped being published. Uh, TSR was very suit happy in those days. So um, there's whole stories you can read about that. Um, but uh, they were very, very clear about, they were going to basically go after anything Gary Gygax did after he left TSR. So, uh, but we do have this book that talks about most of these classes in one way or another. And so by combining comments that Gary made on message boards and then looking at what he was talking about in Mythos, we can get a sense of like maybe what these classes might have looked at. Now, one other place that we can look, however, I don't really use this, but I think it's an interesting thing to look at. Paizo Publishing published this dragon compendium. They called it volume one. And then unfortunately it was going to be the only volume they did. But for a time period during the third uh, edition era, the three E era, basically from 2000 until about 2008, when um, fourth edition came out, Paizo publishing took over the publishing of both dragon and dungeon magazines. And so because they had access to all that, they got permission to publish this book that basically took old articles from dragon magazines history and re-envisioned them in third edition mechanics. Okay. Which was kind of fun. It was a neat idea. I was very excited about because I was super into three E at the time. Um, I still have a long running game that I started in May of 2001 that, um, 
started with third edition and then it eventually went to um uh 3.5 and then pathfinder first edition okay but some of the classes that end up in here interestingly enough are well there's the jester from issue number 60 we talked about before but you have the mountebank and it says based on an idea proposed by e gary gygax in dragon magazine number 65 the one that we were just talking about Okay. And so the problem I have with this is right away, it says, is a trickster allied with the fell powers of the outer planes? Nothing in this article. It's not even an article. It's just a little blur, but nothing in here that Gary says about the mounting back talks about working with the fell powers of the outer planes. I mean, the art's kind of fun. It's cool. This is a picture by Brahm. I love his art. I just, as soon as I opened this, I was so excited to read this because the Mountebank is probably one of the classes from this article that people were the most interested in seeing that they never got to see. And unfortunately, apologies again for the siren, guys. I live right down the street from Fire Station, which is why this happens more frequently than it probably should. Um, but um, this class, to me, really didn't have anything to do with what Gary was talking about. So um, that was unfortunate. Okay, now you have the savant, another one in here. And um, it says it's based on Dragon Magazine number 140. We're going to talk about that in a second. Okay, so there's your savant. The, the mystic doesn't appear in here. And that was kind of it as far as these classes that Gary was talking about. So I wanted to point that out for people. It's, it is a fun book, um, especially if you're a third edition player, um, to get some of these old articles kind of um, you know, put into a format that you can use in a D20 system. There's some fun stuff in here if you're interested in that. Okay. But I'm going to look at, again, some of these things that Gary talked about. So let's first talk about turning the page here in my notes because I took a bunch of notes here. Let's talk about the jester. And what does Gary say about that? So Gary says that to him, the um, jester sort of, it's a gymnast, it's a tumbler. It, and it was, it was all four of these classes. So the jester, the mountebank, the mystic and the savant were going to have their own spell list. So all of them are going to be magic using classes. And so Gary talks about they'd have spells for attention, laughter, anger, etc. And then what we see most interestingly, I think, is again, kind of come from um, mythos from dangerous journeys. So there's no jester class in that game. However, there is a skill called buffoonery. And in the description of this skill, it so it combines joke telling with pranks, and it talks about um, jesting, jokes, pranks, funny stories, double entendres, rude analogies, remarks, physical forms of capering, clowning, gaping, grimacing, leering, prancing, and pratfalls. There's miming and mimicry. There's tricks. And you can do things like amuse or belittle or confuse or distract your opponents. Okay, so all of that is written in this thing. And so this skill of buffoonery, the way it's written up, it's so long that you could take a class with that skill and essentially play a jester if you wanted to. And um, you can tell Gary was really interested in that he put so much time into explaining this particular skill of buffoonery. Okay, and then... Um, so somebody, uh, again, in these message boards is asking Gary, you know, this is what I thought the class is like, do you think this is close to what you would have done? And Gary said, yeah, it's pretty close, but it would have had like illusion and enchantment magic. And also it would have been skilled with like hurled weapons. That was another thing that he was looking at for the gesture. So I guess, you know, nothing super surprising, but it's, it's more about this idea that like, you know, Gary thought this was a viable class option, one. And then two, he creates this buffoonery skill in his Dangerous Journeys game um, to enable somebody to play something that would be akin to a jester. And um, so I kind of think that his version would have looked very close to, um, you know, basically taking this buffoonery skill and then blowing it out into making that, um, you know, a, a little bit more... Um, of a, of a class related thing as opposed to just a skill. Now, one of the things you might be wondering is why didn't Gary just publish these classes in, you know, a new game, a new version of the game? Like why didn't he have a jester class in dangerous journeys? Well, there's a few different reasons for that. So one, you can tell, so TSR was coming after him. So Gary was probably trying to be very careful about what he published so that it didn't look like it was going to be, 
you know, stepping on the toes of D&D or claiming that this was something that you can use in D&D. That's why he doesn't really go back to the game. He doesn't design new things for the game until he does some design work with Troll Lord games, um, things like that. In the third edition era, after Wizards of the Coast has acquired Hasbro, the management behind Wizards of the Coast was very interested in bringing Gary and Dave, kind of like Dave Arneson, back into the fold and like acknowledging their contributions to the game and saying that like, we want you around, we want you to, you know, be involved and like, you know, making sure that they started crediting to those two uh, gentlemen on, you know, in, in, in future publications of the game to ensure that their names are always in there and things like that. So Peter Atkinson was really, um, you know, who's the head of, of, of Wizards at that time. That was really important to him. So Gary does end up doing stuff. Like he starts writing articles in Dragon Magazine and I had a column for a while. And um, again, he does some work where he does design work that, again, that the folks at Troll Lords then kind of like um, convert into D20 system. Gary did, wasn't really writing the mechanics at that point. He was writing, he was creating the ideas. But in any event, um, there's that. Also, Gary does say very specifically that all of his notes on all this like expansion or, or future edition of Advanced D&D that would eventually have become his second edition, Advanced Dungeons and Dragons, whether it was called second edition or not is a whole other thing. But his version of what that game would have been. All of those notes were in his office, he says. And when he left TSR, he was, you know, according to him, not allowed back in. He doesn't, he didn't have his notes. So my guess is at that point, probably it was on a computer um, or maybe it was a typer. I'm not really sure. But in any event, they're, they're like, you know, there's not like today where there's like cloud stores, there's things where like he could have tried to get access to. It's just gone. So he didn't have his notes. So everything he's talking about at this point then is from memory because his notes, he no longer had access to. So that's a big thing to to consider as far as like you know why does some like when people are asking questions like what would this class have done what would have been involved and he it sounds like he's being cagey and i I think that in part of it he's just kind of like he doesn't want to give it to people because he felt like you know it was taken from him and it's not his anymore but also um i think there's a just a big part of it which is that like he didn't remember because you know he, he didn't have it committed to memory he had ideas in his head that he put on paper that he no longer had access to Okay, so that's the um, that's the gesture now. Let's talk about the rest of these three classes. First, the mountebank. Okay, so what Gary says, and again, this is a combination of um, quotes and things that are taken from these message boards. Okay, um, but he basically said they're skilled liars. They're good at sleight of hand. They're tricksters and minor illusionists. And um, one of the things I should point out here is that some of these things are being said actually on the message boards by um, someone else. They're saying, this is what it sounds like you were going for. And then Gary would basically say, yes, that's essentially what it was, but also this, right? So some of this is Gary's words. Some of this is Gary just responding to what somebody else was thinking, but Gary's confirming that, verifying it and saying, yes, that's exactly what it was going to be. Okay. So again, they were going to have their own spell list. And then this person that's writing and saying, I think they're going to be like this. He's saying, it looks like they might've been people like sort of like con men, right? So they would create potions, some of which might actually work, but some of which would just be, you know, um, for show, like a snake oil salesman, essentially is what is what he was saying. Um, maybe they would have a little bit of hedge magic and Gary's like, yeah, that's exactly what that is, but also disguise. And then he said, um, they can impersonate, you know, impersonating people and then affect an audience through talking. Okay. So, um, is essentially how he describes it. Now there's a couple of places where we can look for where a mountebank might have gone. Um, so in mythos, we see, um, that he talks about scheming, trickery, deception, and essentially says they're like flim flam people. That's a mountebank and how it's described in mythos. Okay. So, Again, this is these are ideas. This is what I think is really interesting. So Mythos is published in 1992. Gary writes this article in 1982. So 10 years later, he's still talking about these classes that he proposed in this article in Dragon Magazine to include. And again, he hadn't moved on from this. So Cavaliers are mentioned here. I talked about that before. They end up being published in Dragon Magazine as a class. They end up in Unearthed Arcana in the book. Cavaliers also appear in Mythos. So these ideas are things that he kept with him this whole time, 10 years later. Okay. 
So now, where does the idea of the Mount of Bank come from specifically? Well, interestingly, Gary has uh, some stories written in kind of the Gord the Rogue um, genre of stories that he wrote for um, Gord of Greyhawk. Okay. And there is a story called um, The House and the Tree. And that's part, it's kind of a, I think, like a short story, if I remember correctly. And it's published as part of this um, collection called Knight Errant. And in The House and the Tree, there's a character named Hop. Now, interestingly, he's called Hop the Savant, which is a class that Gary mentions here. But the description of him says that Hop is a mountebank. And it talks very specifically and uses language that Hop is like the premier of all mountebanks kind of thing. And, and that he's extremely skilled at that, at deceiving people and kind of getting people to go along with what he says. It's, so again, he's this con man. He's this flim flam guy. And um, so it might have been a case where he was trying to convince people that he was a savant. But he's really a mountebank, so he's not a savant. Which I, so I just think that's very interesting. Again, this is very early on in Gary's writings, and it's an idea that carries through again into his later game design, where he's talking about this character. So, as far as like a mountebank type character, I think that's kind of what you're really looking at. It's it's this thief, but it's more of um, I want to say Han Solo just because he's so charismatic and he convinces people to that he is better than maybe he really is. Except, you know, Han is definitely a smuggler and does have that thief thing. So that's probably not a great analogy, but more of kind of like this face man. So the the person who's going to convince people to do so, he's, he's not the pickpocket, right? He's not out there like planning heists, but he's out there um, basically swindling people out of their money based on, um, you know, like um, schemes. He's a schemer. Okay. So that, that to me is kind of the mounting bank. Now, why Gary wanted all of these classes to have their own spell list, I'm not really sure. I personally don't think a mountain bank type character needs to have spells to succeed. I think that they could just have some abilities kind of like what we end up with the Bard in third edition, where I know the Bard has spells, but they also have some, some abilities that are based on, you know, how they perform. And those performances can kind of influence people into different directions. I think that would have been a, a better way or a more fun way to take a mountain bank. And I think you could probably play in later editions, a mountain bank as a bard variation. Okay. Rather than a thief variation, I think it kind of makes more sense. Now, the reason Gary doesn't do that here is because at this point, as you recall, you see my video on the history of the bard class bards in this version of the game in advanced D and D first edition are a combination of fighter thief druid. So they're very, very different than the bards that we play today, starting in third edition on. Um, even starting in second edition, the bards very different. So, so it wouldn't have made sense to make the Mounty Bank a a um, subclass of bard because the bard was kind of like its own weird thing, and it just wouldn't have made sense. So having them be a subclass of thief makes sense, but giving them magic powers to me doesn't make sense. Okay, but that's kind of the Mounty Bank um, as proposed, you know, or, or as Gary mentions it in later discussions. Okay. So then we get to the savant. Now this is an interesting one because I just mentioned how Gary's notes were locked in his office. Okay. And also how I mentioned how in this book here, this compendium from Paizo for classes that appeared in Dragon Magazine. And it's, there's one here for the savant and it says um, based on an article by Vince Garcia in Dragon Number 140, December of 1988. So that's right before um, the second edition comes out. But I do have that issue here. And so there is a savant class proposed in this magazine, in this issue. Now, Vince Garcia goes on to write a ton, a ton of articles in Dragon Magazine. He also writes DL15, um, which was Mists of Kryn, uh, Dragonlance 15, which is a module, okay? And uh, he worked on WG11, World of Greyhawk 11 puppets. Uh, and um, uh, so a lot of different TSR publications in this kind of late first edition era, okay? So, um, and also wrote some in early second edition. Okay, but here's his savant class. Now, some people have proposed that because Gary's notes were left in his office, that the folks at TSR got into those notes, were able to get access to them, found this savant, and then 
gave it to Vince and had Vince write it up in this article. I don't think that's true for a variety of reasons. One, why pick the savant? Now, I know Gary said the savant was one of the most requested ones when he talks about that in this article here in Dragon number 67. I just, I don't really think his description was compelling enough that it would have got that many people. I think Gary was excited about having savants. And so he's kind of like, you know, kind of trying to pipe it, pump it up a little bit and hype it up. Okay. So the other thing is why not the mountebank? You never see that appear. If they had access to all these, why wouldn't they have written all of them and put them into dragon magazine? Why pick the savant out of all of them? You know, there's they, yes, they'd already had a gesture, but you never see a mystic show up. You never see um, the mountebank. You see the savant. So I, I just think it's just a coincidence Maybe this was inspired by the idea that Gary wrote this article. I really don't think it's based on Gary's notes, but I could be wrong. You know, of course, it's always possible. But what's interesting in here is that basically it starts out and says the savant is either a cleric or a magic user. And so I'm not going to get too far into this class because this is not the one that Gary had designed. But this write up basically says savants are either clerics or magic users. So it's kind of like the savant magic user and the cleric mystic. So, you know, you, you could say that this is a combination of savant and mystic in one article, two different classes because they're completely different. I mean, they have different arms and armor. They have different um, uh, level titles even. Okay. Um, They have the same experience point tables, uh, but they, they have different kinds of skills and um, areas of knowledge and things like that. So um, it's almost like you got two classes in one in this um, particular article. Okay, so that's the savant from Dragon Magazine number 140. However, what does Gary say? What does Gary say about this class? Well, he says that it's a learned character and it also has, you know, knowledge of arcane things and um, that they would have minor magic use. And then he later goes on to very clearly point out they would have abilities to deal with planar creatures. Now, that's not necessarily something that you get from this right up here. But he does say in in when he's coming in the message boards that they would deal with planar creatures. And so he said it would be like the altered magic of other planes, sage. Uh, they'd have some sage abilities like the sage um, uh, expert, uh, you know, higher hireling class that you could hire. That's detailed in the um, dungeon master's guide. There's a whole section in there and like sages and sage abilities because characters could hire them. And so he talks about that and that they would have some sage abilities. They would have some divination abilities. Okay. Now in 1983, you have the publication of monster manual two. And Gary was talking about this as early as 1982. Um, but it comes out in 1983. And one of the creatures that ends up in this, um, book is called the skipped right past it. I think I skipped right past it. No, I can't. Apparently I forgot how to alphabetize. There it is, the Darrow. Okay. Now, one of the things that the Darrow has is a um, savant type character that is part of like, if you have enough um, Darrow, if you encounter enough, one of them will be a savant. And so it talks in here a little bit about what the savant would um cast spell like what their spells would be and what kind of items that they would carry okay so um it says savant darrows are sage like with the ability to use any sort of magic item and weapon they cast spells as follows affect normal fires anti-magic shell blink light lightning bolt minor creation charm person cloud kill esp all that kind of stuff so i think this is slightly related to like maybe how Gary was envisioning a savant. So interestingly using all weapons and armor, I'm not sure that's something he would have gone forward with, but um, just the idea of like some of the spells and like just calling them savants clearly shows that like this was on his mind. Okay. So, but again, planar creatures seem to be a big part of this or like, you know, magic of the planes. And now when you get to mythos, savants are listed in here and it talks about them and it says that they're mages but they're also skilled in priestcraft so he again he's kind of merging this idea of cleric abilities and magic user abilities because it says that a myth uh, a savant is a mage but skilled in priestcraft but also demonology occultism mysticism they have high intellect and broad learning so that's kind of how he divines this savant so 
Um, for me, I don't know that there's enough here that we have to kind of warrant it being a separate class as opposed to just playing a magic user and picking your spells the way you want and then having a certain personality. Um, you know, he does say that they should have the ability to deal with planar creatures and, and you know, uh, know about occultism and mysticism. If those are items that you want to include in the game, I think that that's something you could certainly do. Um, to me, it just it seems so specialized and so vaguely defined at this point that trying to take this limited information and figure out where he was going with this to create a class, I think is a little difficult. Um but I, I think it's intriguing. I, I think the planar aspects and then the occultism, the mysticism aspects to me are the more interesting parts of it versus like the sage abilities and things like that. We have sages for a reason. So why combine that with all these other things that starts to muddy kind of the core concept to me? Okay, now last up, we're going to talk about the mystic. So what Gary says about this, he says there's augurs, they're clairvoyance. And he also mentions, I think very interestingly, that they have minor monk or cleric abilities. So if we look at the monk class from here, and you look at the abilities, speaking with animals, I mean, maybe um, mask mine so the ESP only has a 30% chance of success. Again, I guess that could be something. Um, being immune to disease, I'm not sure that that has any impact on a mystic. The ability to use self-induced um, catalepsy to appear dead, I'm not sure what that would have to do with a mystic. The ability to heal damage on his or her body, maybe. Uh, I, I'm not sure how that's mysticism. I, I, again, maybe. I guess it depends on how you define the mystic, like what is a mystic. Um, speaking with plants, I could... Uh, makes sense, I guess. Beguiling charms, hypnosis, and suggestion spells have only a 58% chance of affecting the monk. And then telepathic and mind blast attacks um, are uh, made as if the character had a higher intelligence. Okay, so there's that. And then what are some of the other abilities here? Um, they're not affected by poison at a certain level. Uh, Gation quest spells have no effect on them. And then um, that they get their uh, quivering palm, I think it is. So, um, you know, Obviously, the, I think the hand-to-hand -hand abilities there wouldn't really fall into what we're talking about. But, you know, you can look at that and see, okay, I guess there's some things in there that could be modified the way you describe them to be part of a mystic type class. Okay. Also, so some cleric abilities. I mean, really, there's turn undead. I'm not sure that that would belong with a mystic. And, you know, there's, there's healing spells and things like that. But those are spells, so that would be defined by the spell list. Okay. Um, which again, they would have their own spell list. Uh, he said they would be good at divination, which he's already said the savant would do that. So now we have the mystic kind of doubling down on that. And then uh, fortune telling. And then uh, again, somebody in the comments mentioned like astral projection and Gary didn't say no. Um, but then, and then again, because he talks about that the mystics like the savant would also have abilities for dealing with planar creatures. So I feel like, Gary is essentially saying that mystics and savants are almost exactly the same, except one is a magic user subclass and one is a cleric subclass. So they would have access to different spells. And then that does kind of lend credence to the way that Vince Garcia splits the savant into cleric and magic user types in that article in Dragon Magazine number 140. So that would be one, I guess, way you could look at it as like, maybe that is what Gary was thinking. And who knows? Okay. But to me, the way that he describes them, they sound like they're overlapping an awful lot. And um, so then I'm kind of not sure then what's the point of having both of them in the game. Just have one character class that deals with outer planes, creatures and demonology and mysticism and all that kind of stuff and create a class for that. And I think that would have a much better chance of being, um, you know, standing out more than having you know, two different classes that are kind of doing the same thing, but not really. All right. But he talks about that. Now in Mythos, what he says is that they are, uh, mystics are into astrology and divination, fortune telling. Um, and then he talks about, so I'm trying to read my notes here. Oh, medium ship, occultism, pantheology, and then interestingly yoga he puts in there. So, um, which is, I think, sort of like where this idea like that combined all those things 
the the occultism and the mysticism and then that combined with being able to deal with like planar creatures i think that's where this idea of like they, they would be into astral projection came from like projecting your form into the astral plane so um that is kind of like what we have for the mystics so again I, you know based on the way he's describing it Unlike the savant, which I think could be played as just a type of magic user with the correct spell list and maybe a few tweaks, the way he's describing the mystic does kind of sound like maybe it's a separate class because it's got these monk abilities and it has all this other stuff. Um, they don't sound like the warrior monks that a cleric kind of is, you know, with, with having access to all heavy armor and lots of weapons. So I could see the the mystic maybe being its own class. I just would think that it would need to be a little bit more well-defined into having a role in the kind of game that you're playing. Okay. But um, that's basically what we're going to have with these classes. So the sort of the last look, at least as far as I'm aware that we get of these classes um, as the way Gary describes them is, is in dangerous journeys in mythos. Now, Gary does write this series of books. There's actually a Kickstarter going on right now. My Kickstarter might have just wrapped up, but it's by the folks at Troll Lord Games. Um, I think. And I'll put a link to it, but basically it's a, um, they're reprinting all these world books that Gary wrote um, in the, I think it was like the early 2000s. I have one of them. I showed it on the channel here before. And if you see my video on firearms, um, it's called Gary Gygax's Living Fantasy, but he wrote a lot of different books. So I've heard people say that there is a version of the Mountebank in Canting Crew. I don't have Canting Crew. I've looked at it before. I actually didn't see a Mountebank class in there. Uh, maybe I just overlooked it. Okay. But um, in any event, that would have been created for the D20 system. So not you know, something that was compatible with first edition. I'm sure you could, you know, make the conversions if you needed to. So, um, but uh, Trollers is, is, is re um, publishing all those books that have been out of print for years. So that is a good chance to like check out some of this work that Gary wrote later in his career. Um, again, he's not writing anything specific about these classes in here, but you can get bits and pieces of his later era kind of game design philosophy and then try to apply it to some of the things that he wrote here, which is what I was trying to talk about with these comments that he made later on. And then also looking at, you know, I, again, I think that the presentation that we would have gotten for these classes, it would have been very detailed. It would have had so many different level based abilities. Like you just, we just walked through the monk class in, in the player's handbook. And I, and then we saw like how many pages the cavalier and the barbarian took up. I think that's what these classes would have looked like because he's making them so specialized that he's going to give them all these unique abilities to use in very specific circumstances. And the more of those you have, of course, the longer the write up is going to be, as opposed to something like a fighter or a thief, which are kind of very generalist. They apply in a lot of different situations. You have these other classes, the cavalier needing to have like, you know, a very strict social structure and hierarchy in society, or else that class doesn't make sense. You have to be playing in a game where social, you know, your social level and um, is very important. And if you don't have that, then the cavalier sort of loses its place in the game. So having to have all these different subsystems in order to make these classes make sense. I think that to me is where Gary's design philosophy was going in creating these more and more niche specialized classes. Okay. So that's going to be our look at these um, particular four classes. Now in the part two of this video, which again, right now I'm intending to just have there be two parts. It might stretch to three, but as of right now, I'm planning for it to be two parts. So we're going to talk about an article that Gary writes in this magazine. This is Dragon Magazine number 103. And this is in November of 1985. And in here, Gary talks about the future of the game, just to give you a sneak peek. And he's talking about what the second edition books will be like. Now, again, this is November of 1985. Gary will no longer be at TSR when second edition is published. So we don't get his second edition. But what I'm going to do is go through that article and talk about what Gary was proposing. And then we're going to compare it to what we get in here. And I will be visiting Mythos again, Dangerous Journeys, to also talk about what are some things that Gary puts into that game that look like they might have been close to what he wanted in something like this. So, um, but that's just what I think about, about this. I'm sure there's been a lot of people that have 
you know, I know there's been a lot of people that have spent a lot of time on this subject over the years because there is there is quite a bit of interest in what direction the game would have taken had Gary stayed at TSR and what would have happened in second edition. And I know a lot of you are going to have your own thoughts on that, and I would love to hear them in the comments. So um, I'm anticipating I'm going to get a lot of comments on this, and I will try my best to keep up on them. Um, but I'd love to hear your thoughts on where you thought second edition was going. Um, had you heard of these articles before? Had you heard of these classes before? Have you tried to make your own version of any of these classes? And how did that work? Um, were your, you know, have your players played any of them? And the, did they like doing that? Or maybe you, you were a player and you got a DM to let you play one of these, you know, a jester or a mystic or a savant or a mountebank. Um, and I would love to hear from folks that have done that and how that experience was. And maybe you still use them in the game. So definitely leave me a comment below and um, let me know. Also, while you're below, you'll find places to join me on all the social media forums. And I, I do like to interact there as well. So I recently left a post on uh, um, on Facebook. Uh, I did it for my own personal account, but um, just questioning like whether do folks think story comes first and then characters are created or do the creation of the characters and their actions then to turn the story. And um, there's been so much great feedback on that question um, that I left. It was in a particular uh, Facebook group that I belong to about gaming. And uh, it's really fun to kind of see how people look at that. So I love to interact on social media. So um, definitely leave a comment there. And um, that is going to basically wrap this up. So with that being said, I would like to thank you so much for sticking through another long video. I hope that you found it interesting and enjoyable, educational, informative, and uh, please let me know. And until uh, we talk next time, stay safe, happy gaming, and I will talk to you next time. And now for the bonus content, what I was drinking, what I was listening to when I made uh, all of my notes for this particular video. So today is... Monday, April 15th, it's tax day. And as I do every year on tax day since about uh, 2008, maybe, 2000, I, I forget exactly when I started doing this. Might have been a little later. Maybe, let's say 2012, in any event. Um, I made this drink. This is called a Death and Taxes. And it is a um, very rare combination cocktail drink that actually has a split spirit base of gin and scotch, blended scotch. So uh, I used a St. George Terroir gin and I used a Johnny Walker um, blue label actually as my blended scotch. And then um, it also incorporates Benedictine for like an herbal component. And then it has sweet vermouth. I used Coquie du Torino this time. And then uh, a lemon twist uh, expressed, uh, the oils expressed over the top. So um, I first had this at a restaurant here in Pasadena years ago. Um, and uh, unfortunately, the restaurant closed down. It was a great Italian place out of a wonderful cocktail program. And uh, they had barrel aged theirs. And so I was there on the last day that they were open for business. I uh, just stopped in to have a drink because I wanted to experience it one last time. And I had a barrel aged one of these. And then I asked the bartender for the recipe. And then I came home and I immediately barrel aged one of my own. And I used to drink the last little bit of my barrel aged version. Um, for years on tax day, uh, I have run out of my barrel aged version. And so, um, this one I just made fresh. So, um, cheers, uh, to tax day, I guess. I hope everything worked out for you if you're in the U S and, um, that your taxes didn't affect you too poorly. And what I was listening to. So I mentioned last time that April is international jazz month. And so I am going to be featuring jazz albums in my videos, one of my just absolutely all time favorite albums. It's probably might be one of my desert Island albums, but it, if, if not, it's, it's close. Um, Bill Evans, the complete village of Vanguard records. Now this is a boxed set. I picked this up at Amoeba records in Hollywood here years ago before they moved. But this is a series of live recordings that were done at the Village Vanguard, which is in Greenwich Village, and started out as kind of like a beat poet club folk music in the 1930s. Um, but by the mid to late 50s, it had become known for jazz. So Bill Evans and his trio performed there 
1961 in June, June 25th, I believe it was. And they did a couple of sets, afternoon and evening. And this box set basically captures the entirety of both sets, all the music that was recorded. And it's, um, I love jazz piano trios. Um, I love Bill Evans, one of my favorite artists of of any genre. So one of my favorite albums of all time, definitely that one would be on my desert Island uh, uh, list would be kind of blue miles Davis. However, it's very well known that a lot of how kind of blue came together and the way that the, the recordings took place and the music itself was due to Bill Evans who plays piano on four out of the five tracks on that one. Um, but you know, he's a composer. So he's playing here with Scott LaFaro on bass and Paul. Now, technically, that name is pronounced Motian. It's uh, Armenian in nature. And so it would be Motian. However, the drummer himself preferred to pronounce it Motion. So this was the trio. And um, they were, you know, relatively famous again within the jazz world. This was a, a huge performance for them. Unfortunately, what's going to happen is, so this is recorded June 25th, Scott LaFaro ends up dying in a car accident um, just a couple weeks later on July 6th, and it just wrecked Bill Evans. Bill had struggled with heroin addiction for the majority of his career, um, and uh, he dies young, uh, as so many jazz people did, um, you know, young-ish, you know, I think it's in the 80s, when, uh, you know, in the 1980s when he passes away. Um, but um, he had a lot of struggles, and um, the death of Scott LaFaro was a huge blow to him because they, these three guys, their trio had a very, um, intuitive, you know, sound together where they were, they were playing off of each other. They were listening to each other. It was just, it, everything gelled and Scott not being part of that really affected Bill's performance, his composing, just everything. It was extremely sad. So when you listen to this and knowing what's going to happen, it is kind of sad. However, I prefer to look at it more as a celebration of the greatness of this trio. So what comes out of this, all of these recordings are two different albums. So um, one is called Sunday at Village Vanguard, and it takes a, a, some of these tracks, some from the um, from the afternoon session and some from the evening session. It picks the best ones, puts them onto a record. And that one, and um, I think is the one, there's also Waltz for Debbie, um, but it might be this whole complete one. I, I can't remember exactly, but at least one of those three, it's on that like thousand and one albums to listen to before you die. And, uh, it rightfully belongs there. I've listened to a podcast of people that review the albums and, um, they just completely miss the point of this album. They, they just don't get it. They think it's pointless. They don't understand why it's on the list. They are very much classic rock guys. That is very clear from listening to them. That is in their wheelhouse. And so whenever they talk about jazz, it's very obvious that they're going into it thinking that they're not going to like it and they don't want to appreciate it. And um, so they just all completely um, just miss the point of what makes this album so great. They talked about the recording being incorrect it's, and the, the bass is too high and all this kind of stuff. They're, they're wrong. So just that's how that goes. But, um, you know, obviously they're entitled to their opinion. But great liner notes in here uh, in this box set. And um, we can see here. There's Bill in the middle with Scott LaFaro and Paul Motian. And um, just more, that's the poster of the cover. Some little bits and pieces like the set list, you know, re reproductions, of course. And uh, some photos from the event. And then you have, you know, your different albums here. So, um, Sorry about that, but um, yeah, there's so much music. So it's on multiple, um, four different LPs. So the afternoon set one, afternoon set two, and evening set one, evening set one continued, and evening set two, and then you have uh, evening set three. So again, they pulled music from all of these and then put them onto a couple of different albums. And uh, this was the last uh, live recording that was made by this version of the trio before um, Scott LaFaro's death. So um, again, it's all, you know, it's all instrumental. It's, it's like I said, sometimes uh, I use this word a lot, but it's very contemplative. It's, it's just, I love it. It's um, the piano playing is just magnificent. The songs, 
are great. It's a mixture of originals plus um, some standards on here. Um, but you can see there's um, Gloria's Step. There's Alice in Wonderland. I love that particular version of Alice in Wonderland. It's such a great song. Um, but My Foolish Heart, All of You, My Romance, Some Other Times, Solar, My Man's Gone Now from Porgy and Bess, Waltz for Debbie. So that was written for, um, uh, she, I just that was written for Bill Evans' niece, I believe it was. She was uh, into dancing at the time, and so he wrote a song for her. There's Porgy, you know, I Loves You, Porgy, again from Porgy and Bess. And uh, Milestones was a tune uh, recorded by Miles Davis and his band, of course. And um, so basically you just see, you know, because it's different sets, there, there's different versions of the song. But anyway, I highly recommend this, recommend you checking out some Bill Evans. Um, he has a very um, diverse and wide catalog. Um, I did one of his albums before that he did. Um, he did an album solo piano with um, Tony Bennett singing. And I featured that right after Tony Bennett passed away as sort of my tribute. So that's also a fun one if you're into more of the lyrical side of jazz. Um, but definitely check this out. And again, happy tax day. Or I could also say happy Jackie Robinson day. I think that's something more fun to, uh, to uh, you know, celebrate on April 15th. But uh, cheers again. And thank you so much for watching.